Amen. Amen. Praise Jesus. God bless, God bless everyone. And can we quickly turn our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 9, please. Luke chapter 9. And I'll read from the verse 37 to the verse 50. Just bear with me. Amen. Among the three scriptures that were read, I just want to read the Luke again. Praise Jesus. Peter said, to say the same thing to us is not grievous, but it's helpful. Luke 9, 37. And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. That's King James English. Many people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only child. And lo, that is, behold, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly cried out, and it terrified him that he foameth again, and bruising him, hardly departed from him. Oh. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Emphatic. And Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears, another way of saying, into your heart. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that saying. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thoughts of their hearts, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Hallelujah. Say to yourself, he is calling me to greatness. If, if, if you can't tell someone sitting next to you, say, hey, he is calling you to greatness. And he's calling me to, to greatness. Hallelujah. You see, the other person might not believe what you're telling them. So just tell him about yourself. Tell him or tell her, he's calling me to greatness. He's calling me to greatness. He's calling me to greatness. Praise God. I am, there, is a, um, there is a popular saying, and I'm sure you've heard it before, that half-truth is always dangerous. And one of my favorite quotes on this subject comes from Alexander Pope. And it is this. He says, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. 
drink deep. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Drink deep. End of quote. We often deceive ourselves when we just want a little knowledge. We say we are tired of learning or we don't want too much. Often the world presents us with half truth and sadly the church which is the light of the world the city set on a, on a hill turn, we often turn to this darkness in the world to guide very sad we tend to follow their lead why do I say this a favorite line so common in our society in our world today is this if you are an eagle don't play with their chickens i'm sure you've all heard it if you're an eagle don't play with chickens the point uh, being made here is this that do not hang out with people who are going nowhere else you too will go nowhere the point is the statement is half truth or it is just a little knowledge. It doesn't give you the full picture, that statement. If you're an eagle, don't hang out with the chickens. The kingdom of God always provides us with the full truth, full knowledge. It gives us absolute knowledge. Hallelujah. The, the desire to be great, as we just stated, that he's calling me to greatness. The desire to be great is something that is part of our makeup. We are created by a great God who desires us to be great? If you look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he said to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will make thy name great. And then in Galatians chapter 3, the 13th to the 14th verse, it reads, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And then it goes on to the verse 14 and says, that we might receive the blessings of Abraham. What was his blessings of Abraham? That God will make him great. And we have been redeemed by Christ so that we would Inherit this blessing of Abraham. Hallelujah. And so you see, so it's that we, we've been, so to, to understand this call to greatness, we need to understand Jesus. Hallelujah. We need to get our concept of greatness from Jesus and not from the world and in this passage that we just read Jesus shows us what it means to be great hallelujah Amen. and it is this great people I mean really great people If you are great, or if you think you are great, it is because you help the helpless. You identify with the socially insignificant. And you help or you encourage 
help us in the kingdom. This is the concept of greatness in the kingdom of God. This is the concept. How does Luke present this to us? Both Luke, Mark, and Matthew present this story, or this narrative, or you can call it story, but they present it in different ways. And of course, because of, the, because of what Luke wants to say here, he presents it in a, 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 bit, a bit different. The most detailed of all these accounts is Mark's. Mark gives us a very de de detailed account. So we will dip into, into Mark as we go along to explain some things that Jesus said in this passage in Luke. So it begins like this. After they have been on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, God had got the, Jesus go to the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And they were very heavy with sleep. And as he was praying, he was transfigured. And they saw, they, they, they opened their eyes and they, and they see Moses and Elijah talking with him and his clothes glowing. And Peter, not knowing what to say, you know what, let's build tabernacles here and all that. And one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, Jesus. And, and God interrupts his speech and says, hey, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. So the focus is, is and must be on Christ Jesus. Not Moses, not Elijah, Jesus. He is my man, Jesus. So with this wonderful approval from God in the eyes of the, of the disciples and everything, they descend the mountain. And when they come down, the nine disciples who did not go with them are waiting underneath the hill or the mount. And, but not just them. Jesus meets a big, a large crowd. And from Mark's account, or okay, okay from, from Mark's account, th there was some commotions going on there. So Jesus inquired, and then a man comes out and, 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 and says, Master, Master, I brought my son who is being tormented by, by a spirit. This spirit would often seize him and the boy for, for fear of the of what is coming would often give a loud cry and the spirit will convulse this boy's body and squeeze him so much that his, his muscles become so tight by the time that that spirit is, is, is finished with the boy, the boy feels so weak and can't do anything. Poor little boy. But I brought, I brought him to your disciple. I brought him to, to, to you. Did, did not see you. Saw your disciples. Asked them to help, but they could not. Jesus Christ then says, Oh, you faithless and perverse generation. How long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to suffer you? And then he says, Bring the boy here. So he calls for the boy. As the boy is coming to Jesus, the spirit seizes him again and does the same thing. But Jesus rebuked the spirit, unclean spirit, heals the boy and gives the boy back to his father. Wonderful. Then the people are happy. They are rejoicing. They are, they are, they are, they are, they are excited, especially the man and all the others around. They are also praising God. Then Jesus seriously turns to his disciples and tells them, let this thing sink into your heart. Not what has happened, but what I'm going to tell you. Let it sink deep into your ears, in other ways, in, 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 in other words, into your heart. Let it sink deep. And it is this, that the Son of Man is about to be crucified, or is about to be betrayed, and given into the hands of men, indicated his death. But the disciples, it passed, you know, it came through here, it passed here, came through there, and then that was it. They didn't understand a thing he was saying. 
But later on, as they went along, he overheard them discussing among themselves who will be the greatest, who will be the greatest. So he came along them and he said, Do you know what? You are inquiring who will be the greatest? I'll show you. He picks a little child and he said, Whoever receives this child receives me. And whoever receives me receives the Father. And the least among you is the greatest. As he teaches them this lesson, John then says, Master, we saw someone who was casting out devils in your name. But because he doesn't, he doesn't join, he, he doesn't follow us like we follow you. He's a loner. We told him to stop it. We told him, come on, don't use, our, don't use our master's name. You're not allowed. And Jesus' reply was this. He says, don't stop such a person. Anyone who is not against you is for you. Hallelujah. Anyone who is not against you is for you. Hallelujah. Can we all say that together? Anyone who is not against you is for you. If they are not against me, they are for me. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. You need to convince yourself of this truth that if they are not against you, they are for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. So what, is, what do we learn from all this? The first we will learn from this passage is this. That Jesus has just on the mountain just been lifted up high. He's been lifted above Moses, lifted above Elijah. Because God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Forget about any other. And then when he comes down the mountain... The man, the father, whose boy is being disturbed by this unclean spirit, calls him master. Another word for master is great teacher, teacher, or rabbi, or doctor. So he recognized Jesus as a master, as, as a teacher. One who teaches the way of God and directs the way of God. And like... Nicodemus said, the, the, the Pharisee, we know you are a teacher sent from God. Why? Because the things you do, no one can do them except God be with him. So Jesus was teacher par excellence. He was beyond all the others. He was above all the others. So here we see that he is set apart above all. That is the image we get of Christ in this passage. That he is above all. Or well, that's the picture that we get. But as he comes down, as he comes down, he comes to meet people, many people, and what is the problem? The problem is this. A man has a child who is in desperate straits. The man is helpless. More so is the boy. A little boy being tormented, being disturbed. By an unclean, evil, foul, and wicked spirit. Who seizes this boy. Twists his body. Presses him so hard. Like weakening his muscles. What for? Just to destroy. Just to destroy. 
And this man is concerned, and would you not be if he was you? And listen to what the man says. The man, the man, the man says, he is my only child. He happened to be a boy, but he's my only child. I mean, that's all he has. So one, the father is concerned because if he dies, there's no one else after him. That's it. His generation is just cut off. Number two, if, he's, if this boy is destroyed by the spirit, when he grows up, who is going to take care of him? So it was a very big issue for, for him because socially and economically, he was going to be affected. Besides, he has a love for this boy. And the boy himself is being troubled by something. I'm saying something because, you see, when physical things happen to you and you can see them, you can address them. But when what is happening to you is spiritual, you can't see it. But it is troubling you. Dealing with it is challenging. And that was what the boy found himself. And besides, he's a little boy. A helpless little boy. And here we have great teacher, great master, one approved by God, Christ, the Christ of God, the Messiah. And when he comes down and he meets this situation, what does he say? He says, when the man tells him, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not. And the thing that came out of his mouth was this, oh, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you and suffer you? Now, who was he addressing? This is a question that has bothered many minds. Who is he addressing? The disciples? The man? Or who? Who is he addressing? God have mercy. Hallelujah. The thing is this. He, if you say he's addressing the disciples, fine, because they were often very weak in faith, weren't they? It, it takes them so long a time to get things, usually get things. Yes, Christ will say something and has to say it over and over and over and over, and over again before they, could, before they could get it. They were kind of like, they were, they were very, very slow. Very, very slow individuals. No wonder you will say it is them. Right. But the only person that Jesus Christ used this word faithless for was Thomas. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead and... And all of them have seen Jesus, and Thomas hasn't seen Jesus, so he says he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Jesus Christ appears and says, Thomas, come and put your finger, as you said, in the hole on my side. And be not faithless. Christ used this word relating to Thomas. What about the others? The other nine or the other, or the other ten or the, the, other, the, other, the other eleven. He didn't, he didn't address them in that way. Also, the word perverse. Perverse talks about people who have turned away from God. Now the question is, have these disciples turned away from God? Someone who has turned away. One, yes, they were a bit unstable in their, in their faith, but would you say that they were faithless, that they were fickle, that they couldn't really focus on Christ all the other time? And would you say they were perverse, that they had turned away from God onto other things? Now, if we go to Mark chapter 14, sorry, Mark 9, in Mark 9, the verse 14 and the 15. In Mark's account, which we read earlier on, we see that in the verse 14 and 15, when Christ comes, it said, and when he came 
to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and ran to him. And verse 16, and he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? So the scribes here, you know, were kind of like questioning the disciples and possibly they were questioning him about why couldn't you guys heal, uh, cure this boy? You see, you make so many claims, you, you, you make too many claims that you can do this, you can do that, but, but here we have a boy in front of you, you can't do anything, you probably chastising them, you know, lashing them, giving it unto them, and Christ knew what they were doing, that what they were doing wasn't right. They were basically telling them that, making them feel there was nothing in this. So basically, they couldn't do it because they had no power. They, they had nothing in their ministries. All they do is just open the book and then just teach it. But, te but, but Jesus is different. He hears from God and he teaches the truth of God. And besides, for them to, you know, be charging the disciples and be quarreling with them and be arguing with them over this issue wasn't right. Because all throughout the work of Christ, they had seen Christ healing the sick, raising the dead, doing miracles. I mean, doing great things by the power of God. But here they were challenging the disciples, arguing with them. And Christ asked them, what are you questioning my disciples for? What, what is all this about? So they, they were the ones he was referring to as faithless. You have no trust in God and you've turned your back on God. What a generation. What a generation. What a generation. That because of this issue, you are, you know, having this thing, this, this, this challenge or this, this question with my disciples. What are you doing? And here he says, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I suffer you? As how long should, should I endure you? Among, for all that I have done, you still remain the way you are. And then he says, bring thy son hither. Bring thy son here. Bring thy son here. Now we are getting into the, into the meat now. So, the, the, so as the boy is coming... The spirit wanted to display again, and Christ rebukes the spirit, heals the boy, hand the boy back to the father. Now watch something here. This is the great master. This is a great teacher. He's demonstrating to us. He's showing us something. Now you see, those who are approved by God, those who are anointed by God, those who are sent by God, they are in to help the helpless. They are not in to just be big by themselves. He is called teach, master, great teacher. But here he finds himself helping. Let me say this before I, I continue. All the three stories we seem to have read, they all saying the same thing. Luke is presenting the same truth to us. Verse 49 to 50. 46 to 48 and 37 to 46, he's presenting the same truth to us. It's about greatness and what it does. And here he's demonstrating or showing to us what greatness in the kingdom of God is like. Those that are great, those that are great, help the helpless. Those that are great in the kingdom of God, they help the defenseless. This was a little boy who was defenseless against something he can't even see. And here Jesus brings in, he brings all his greatness, all his awesomeness to, to the scene and helps this boy out. Hallelujah. Praise God. You see, this this is what greatness in the kingdom of God does. Greatness in the kingdom of God does not just, you know, boast itself. It does not just feel excited about itself. It does not gloat in itself. 
To be great in the kingdom of God is to be able to help the helpless and help the defenseless. Something he does here wonderfully. Hallelujah. And you see, see what the man does here. The man, look at the verse. Look at the verse 38. The man comes to Jesus Christ and says, And behold, a man of the company cried out. Let's look, look 938, please. Look 938. And, um, and behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee. Look, I beseech thee. I beseech thee. Look upon my son. Look upon my, I beseech thee. I beseech thee indicates, um, I beg you. For a man to come to this point where he's begging another. A man begging another man. I, I beg you. Indicating he was in desperate straits. He's come to the extreme end. I mean, he's, he's, he, he, he really has got nothing else to do. He's helpless. And so is the boy. And he says, look upon my son. That means have pity or have compassion upon us and help us have compassion upon us this morning as we are gathered in the house of the living God is there something that makes you feel so helpless do you feel defenseless that there are things that are warring against you and you you know what I don't know how to fight back on this I've come to tell you Christ, the king of the kingdom, does not sit on the throne just to be worshipped, just to be bowed down to. He offers himself to help the helpless. He's a great king, and as a great king, he's great because he gives himself up to help the Helpless. To help the helpless. To help the who? Helpless. He's a great king of the kingdom. And furthermore, furthermore, that wasn't all. That wasn't all. After he's cured the boy, rebuked the evil spirit, and cure the boy, and the people are rejoicing. Oh, God is wonderful. God is great. God is awesome. You would have expected, you would have expected that having told them they are faithless, they are perverse, and now he's turned their minds around and they are praising God and worshiping God and are happy about what God has done. You would have expected Jesus to be very excited. Wouldn't you? You would have expected him to be very excited because he's managed to turn their eyes from, you know, turn them from their perverseness and, and at least brought them into faith. But verse 43. And they were all, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But wow, but, notice the word but. Indicating while they were all amazed and about the mighty power of God, someone wasn't in with them. But, but while they wondered everyone at all things, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, he turned the whole thing, you know, around. And what does he say? He says, let these sayings sink down into your ears or into your heart. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Whew. That was like a slap in the face. Rejoicing. They were happy. And, and see, and the disciples themselves are rejoicing and happy. Now, why am I making, why am I emphasizing this point? I am emphasizing this point because in the eyes of the Jewish people, of which the disciples were a part, they're beginning to see 
they begin, especially those who were with him on the mountain, the three of them, they were beginning to see the messianic nature of Christ showing forth. That what man could not do, and hey, hey, before I forget, before I, before I forget, these disciples, they were not the only disciples who could not cure or heal someone who was not well. Okay? They were not, they were not the first, and they will not be the last. Hello? So if, if a disciple is not able to do something, it doesn't mean that the master can't do it. But the point that Luke, Luke is emphasizing here is not so much about the disciples, but the master himself. That is why I'm not so much measuring on that point. Why am I saying that? You remember in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings, when, Eli, when the Shunammite woman's son died, and Elisha told Gehazi to go and put his staff, his walking stick on the child. Gehazi went, did all that, but nothing happened. The child still died more. He died more when, 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 Gehazi, when Gehazi put it there because time, time was running out. So the boy was, so the, so the boy was dying more. <laughs> Until Elisha himself came and resurrected the boy. Hallelujah. So what happened here is no new thing. Praise God. Just, just, just to put your mind to rest. If you can't do it, it doesn't mean that Jesus can't do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. He, 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 he's a great king. And as a great king, his greatness is for one purpose, to help. And this is the point I'm driving at in the verse 44. He says, let this thing sink deep into your heart. They are rejoicing. They are happy. Whoa, it's the Messiah. It's, it's the Messiah. Wonderful, great. They're all happy about it. You're rejoicing about it. Because in the Jewish mind, the Messiah is a hero. And no one can defeat the Messiah. No one. No one can stand against the Messiah. But here, while they are rejoicing about, about him and what he's done, he turns to one and tells them, hey, let this thing sink deep into your heart. Because the Son of Man is going to be betrayed very soon. Oops, it's like he burst their bubble. Oops, I am going to be betrayed very soon. And the Bible says they did not understand. Of course, they did not, they will not understand. Because that thing was not in their thinking. The idea of the Messiah, the hero of God, to be captured by, by men, impossible. Impossible. He's too great. He's the greatest. He's the greatest. But they did not un understand what the Messiah really meant when he came on earth. With all his greatness, with all his power, with all the, his, his ability, his purpose was to help helpless humanity. Hallelujah. He had to be captured. Praise God. You see, what he said here, he had said before in verse 22 of, of chapter 9. We had already seen that. He, he has already said that. He told them before in verse 22, ch Luke, Luke ch chapter 9. He says, okay, verse, tw verse 21, just to make sense. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man this thing. That saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be slain and be slain. Means to be killed and be raised the third day. This they did not want to accept. Killed? The Messiah killed? Impossible. So they didn't want to entertain those thoughts because in their minds, the Messiah is great. The Messiah is mighty. The Messiah is awesome. The Messiah is strong. And so a strong person has always remained strong. But they did not understand that in the kingdom of God, greatness is not just for the sake of greatness. Greatness is always to help the helpless.
If you are struggling to accept this truth, it means you have the Jewish understanding of, of, of Messiah. And that's why I'm preaching what I'm preaching. <laughs> Greatness in the kingdom of God is for a purpose. It is to help the helpless. What does it mean to be great? It means to be strong. It means to be honorable. It means to be admirable. To be powerful. To be at an advantage place. To be great. Like God, God, God told Abraham, I will make you great. For what? So you'll be able to help the helpless. And here, if you look at, if you look at Luke 24, let's, let's fast forward. Luke 24 and the verse 67, please. Luke 24, verse 6 to 7. Just go ahead of us. Let's go ahead of ourselves and look at a few things and we will come back. Verse 6, verse 6. When he rose from the dead, listen to what the angel said. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. I will rise again. Even though he said rise again, they did not hear the rise again. They, or they, the, the idea of him dying, they didn't want to accept it. So he's already told them. It, it looks like I'm speaking again. I am... I'm pressing against a brick wall. So let's, so let's keep going. Because it looks like um, I'm, I'm not getting through, but I will get through. Praise God. Hallelujah. So let's keep going. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 2, please. Acts 2.23. I just need to make this point because Acts 2.23. Acts 2 is after the book of John. St. John. Acts 2.23. Here, Peter is speaking and he, and he says, Him, that's to talk, talking about Jesus. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now watch the words that I used at the very beginning. Determinate counsel. Him. Being, de being delivered by the determinate council. The determinate council meaning that what God has already determined to do. God's already determined plan. That is, God had already determined a plan. And the plan was to deliver him into the hands of men. Hello? So, let me make this clear. It wasn't that... The people were able to overcome the Messiah. It wasn't that the people were stronger than the Messiah. But it was because God himself had already pre-planned that they, that, that they would be able to do this. That he would give them this thing to be able to do. He will allow them to, to do this. Okay. I still haven't convinced you. I can, I can see that. Come with me to chapter 4. Acts 4. I can see. I, I, can see, I, have, I still haven't convinced you. Uh, verse 27, please. Acts 4, 27. Acts 4, 20, 27. Hallelujah. Praise God. Verse 20. Acts 4, 20, 27. For, it says, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus... Whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. Verse 28. To do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Restatement. That what they did, being able to capture Christ and kill him and put him on the cross, it was all for whatever... Thy hand, 
whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel. It was God's own hand and God's own counsel, God's own plan, pre-plan that this should happen. So what I'm saying is this. The Messiah is indeed powerful. The Messiah is indeed great. But God in his own plan determined that he should be crucified. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Greatness in the kingdom of God is not greatness until it is there to help the helpless. Okay, maybe I still haven't convinced you. John 10, let's get back to John 10. John 10, 17. This one should convince you. Praise God. John 10. John 10, 17 and 18. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 10, 17 to, did I say John 10, yeah? John 10, 17 and 18. I read. He says, this is, this is, Jesus, this is Jesus himself speaking. And he's saying, Therefore does my father love me. Because, giving reason why the father loves him. I lay down my life that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down it of myself. Willingly. Oh, Mark. He's saying, I willingly laid down my life as the Messiah. So he was. <laughs> Him being betrayed and being delivered to the hands of men, it was a willing decision. As the greatness of God, as the great power of God, as the great Messiah, as a great teacher. He willingly offered himself. And that is the point we are making. That in the kingdom of God, greatness offers itself to the helpless. In the kingdom of God, greatness willingly gives themselves to help those who are helpless and defenseless. In the kingdom of God, Greatness, great people in the, in the kingdom do not see the helpless and the defenseless by go struggling and then they fold their hands and, you know, they lift their shoulders and walk in greatness. No! In the kingdom, great people, when they see the helpless and the defenseless, they come, they step down. Willingly, they step down. They step down willingly. They step down willingly and offer themselves. They offer themselves willingly to help the helpless. This is what Christ does. This is what the greatness in the kingdom does. How many of us are great in the, in the kingdom? Great in the kingdom. We offer ourselves willingly to help the helpless and to defend the defenseless, as our master did. Or as our master does. So here, he says, greatness, I'm great. So here, you see, he is demonstrating, he's showing us what he's doing. But then in John, he says, hey, I lay down my life. And what was the laying down of the life for? I lay down my life so that those who are caught and are helpless in the bondage of sin can be freed. Amen. That we can be freed from the grips of sin and Satan and fear. The world fear sin and the grip of Satan and all his demonic hosts so we can be free from them because 
until Christ steps in, until the great Messiah, until the great Christ steps into a life, that life is held in bondage, helpless, defense, defenseless, can't do anything about those spirits because they're spirits, you can't, you can't even see them. Greatness. So he steps in. So he, so when he was being given to the hands of men and being crucified on the cross, it was to bar us our redemption. And that is greatness offering itself for our salvation. Greatness offering itself. And that is the message. I, I, I lay down my life willingly. 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 Then, unfortunately, because their understanding of the Messiah was not the same as Christ's understanding, when he spoke, they did not understand. And that is usually the case. So when you have people who don't understand the things that somebody is saying, you know, you know when somebody says something and you don't understand, <laughs> you just quickly just brush it, brush it off. That was exactly what was happening here. And then as they went along, Something happened. That reminds me of a statement a boy made. Something happened. In verse 46, praise God. In verse 46, the story continues. We have an, a, another picture. Then there arose a reasoning amongst them, which of them should be the greatest. You know, if you read, a, if you read Mark's account, you have, um, you have the boy's mother, John and uh, James, their mother come in and asking Jesus, can you let my sons, one of them sit on your right hand side, one of them sit on your left hand side in your, in your, in your kingdom. They were trying to buy, you know, they, they were trying to buy their place for greatness. Hallelujah. Hey, greatness is something that God is calling you and me into. Let's settle that. Hallelujah. Greatness. Because we serve a great God and he's called us into a life of greatness. Now, this greatness shows itself by being there to support or to help the helpless and the defenseless. Now we, now we, now we, now we, now we, now we carry on. And he says, they were well, again, again, among, among themselves, who is the greatest? And Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, took a child and set him by him. And he said, whoever shall receive this child in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. The same shall be great. What is he saying here? What is he saying here? He's simply saying, the least among you is the greatest. Whoever is the least amongst you. Okay. Now let's let's put it. Let's in ancient times, right? In ancient times, <laughs> status that is status in life, social status in was a big thing for them. It was a very big thing. And children in those in those times had no status a child had none <laughs> so when you're doing things when you're when you're when you're doing anything you want to rather be you know be working with adults people who are grown up you want to be working with those people because that is that is what will account that is what will, will make you popular that actually you are doing something for 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 people but for the little little children and all that it wasn't really they didn't really give much consent to the children. Unfortunately, our society is, is, is way, way different from the earlier age with regards to issues to do with children. Now, attending to children is a big thing. But back then, that wasn't the case. So Christ took a child to illustrate what he meant by greatness. Because as in that culture or in that in that in that age children had no status so christ picked up a child and 
put them there and said, if you receive this child, okay, the child in that time was a representation of someone who is dependent and children still are de dependent. Was an example of someone who needs taken care of. And of course, children still need taken care of. Someone who needed support. And children still need support. Someone who needs attention. And children still need attention. And they were mostly helpless. Mostly vulnerable. So what he was saying was this, if someone needs support, okay, those who are, those who need attention, they need care, they need, they, they need to be supported. If you're able to receive them in my, because of me, you receive them and you help them, you have received me and you've also received the father. And because you have identified with, you have identified, you've, you have recognized such a person because most people don't rec recognize. And that is the way of the world. The world says, hey, you need to fly with the Joneses. Why are you bothering with people who are so needy? If you run with the chickens, you always be a chicken. But Christ is saying, hey, if you are an, if you are an eagle, Come help the chickens fly too. At least help them to jump a, a little bit. They may not fly where you are, but at least lift them up. The world will say, if you are an eagle, stop messing around with the chickens because you will never be able to rise up. You see, but that is not the concept of the kingdom. In the kingdom, we serve or we, we serve a great God Hello? We are to relate with him. We are to exchange strength with this great God. We are to engage with him, interact with, with God. And the wisdom and the treasures and the, the honor and the things he places upon us, we are now to come down and help the needy. Help the ones that are dependent. Those ones that can support themselves. We have to come down and help them. We are not to say, well, I don't want to associate with, you know, I want to keep on rising, rising. So all my friends are good people. All my friends are powerful people. You see, I'm a rich man, some will say. So I don't want to associate with poor people or, or else, you know, they will ask me for too much money. So I don't want to associate with them. So some people, they only give to the, to the top. They give to those who can give back to them. And Jesus Christ said, no, 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 no. Even in your giving, don't give like that. Give to those who can give back. Hello? Don't give to those who will always give you back. Give to those who can't give back. That is, when you, so in the kingdom, we are not saying just stay there. But we are saying, as you engage with God, bring it down. Engage with God, bring it down. Bring it down to do what? To help. Identify. Don't neglect. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Praise God. Okay. Let's look at Matthew 20, please. Let's, Matthew 20, verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Just to establish, to make this point. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 20. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, in the world, I'm sure we are all aware that in the world, people seem to have no time or have no patience if you are weak. If you are weak, what does the world do? The world just <laughs> lay him off. Lay him off. If you have ever watched... I don't intend to incite, to, to incite anyone on anything, but if you watch those ships that used to carry slaves from wherever to wherever, 
as they were coming. Then when you grow weak, what they what they do? Do they give you any medication to, 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 to make you better? No, they just throw you into the sea, just kill you. They only want the best. The world only wants to work with the best, with the, with the strong. But in the kingdom of God, those who are great, those who are strong, those who are powerful, those who are mighty, they work with the weak to lift them, to strengthen them. We work with the weak to strengthen them. We work with the lowly to lift them up. Hallelujah. This is the greatness in the kingdom. Now verse 20, please. Verse 20. Matthew 20 verse 20. Matthew. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. They are very ambitious. And Christ didn't, Christ didn't tell them off. And he said unto them, Yeah, you shall indeed drink indeed. You shall drink indeed of my cup. Because he knew they were going to be per persecuted big time. So he said, Yes, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. You will drink. Of, of my cup <laughs> and be baptized with my baptism <laughs> that I'm baptizing because it's a baptism with fire. You, you're going to get it tough. So yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Why? And the ten heard it and they were moved with indignation, anger, I mean, come on, if it was you, wouldn't you be? Imagine we are all in a church, and then we happen to meet Jesus, or meet the Father. And then when we meet the, the Father, Mrs. Adai, quickly, Mrs. 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 Adai and Mrs. Uh, Jamana quickly run, run to the Father and say, Father, choose us. Let us sit here, let, let us sit here. Le leave the others. Let them, let them, let them, let them, let them sort themselves out. And we, and we all hear it. What would we say? Ah, these women. This is how they are. So the others were angry. They were upset. Uh, but once they were upset, Jesus, verse 25, but Jesus called unto them, unto, unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. The word minister means servant. Hello? The word minister, oh, he's, he's a minister of God. We, we make it sound so posh, but actually it means that he's a slave of God. He's a, he's a servant of God. Hello? That, that, that's what it means. Let him be your minister. Amen? Amen. And, and whosoever will be chief, if you're going to be chief among you, let him be your servant. And then he asks in the verse 28, even so, sorry, even as a son of man, came hallelujah now this is the point even as i came not to be ministered unto but to minister i did not come to be served oh my goodness i made my point now i did not come to be served i am the great one of god i'm the messiah i'm the christ but i did not come to cross to sit on a big throne cross my legs and you all come bringing things and bowing down to me and serving me i rather came to serve you i came to minister unto you i came to meet your knees i came to lift you up high i came to see you wherever you are wherever you are downtrodden i came to to lift you up from the from the dunk hill i came to lift you up i came that the poor might become rich i came i came i came so that the discouraged may be encouraged 
I did not come just to just to feel good about myself and, and just to will power, but I came to lift, lift, lift those who are dependent. I came to give them support. I did not come just to, you know, satisfy my own self. I did not come just to wear nice, nice robes. But I came to give a helping hand. I came to give a helping hand. I came to support. Sometimes, you know, when you are great in the kingdom, it, it is unthinkable that your hands should touch dirt. God have mercy. Oh, that our understanding of, the, of greatness in the, in the kingdom will be like that of Christ. Who came to serve, and we, we all we all know what, what he did just before he died when he took the towel, put it around him like a servant, and came to every disciple, put the towel in the water, and he washed every one of them their dirty feet. He said, I did not come to be served, I came to rather to serve you. Oh, oh my god. How did we get this so wrong? How did we think that greatness in the kingdom? How did we get to how did we get to this place where we thought greatness is in, in, in the kingdom is about you know wearing coat hunger suits and getting people coming and just polishing our shoes and going away when we rather are meant to be polishing this? God have mercy and deliver us. And woe betides you. Woe betides you. If you don't call us by the right title, you are dead. We will, we will, we would, we would ostracize you and we would make sure that you know you get no post. We will make sure you get no post. You don't call me bishop, you don't call me pastor, you don't call me reverend. I'll make sure you get no post in the church. If you just come and call me Samuel. But I thank God, God, what God told Abraham. I will make your name great, not your title. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. If you leave me, I will go there. Ah, let's drop all those things and, and just think about serving. Serving the flock. Oh God almighty. If, if you're a pastor, you are hearing me wherever you are. I'm just, I'm, I'm just bringing to your attention that our calling is to serve the people of God. And if you're a Christian, I've just come to tell you that now we are called to be great. And in great in serving the needs and, and supporting people and, and lifting people from the downhill. You see... The major difference between the world idea of greatness and greatness in the kingdom that Christ is showing us here is this. Once God releases greatness to help the helpless and defenseless to lift them up to make them stand, the world crashes the weak to a corner and celebrate the, the, the strong. I have never seen the world celebrating the weak. They always pick the strong and celebrate them. So if you are weak, the world doesn't want to know you. But in the kingdom, those who are weak, are to be strengthened to stand. You see, the world boasts of helping the best to be the best. But in the kingdom, God boasts of lifting the poor, weak, and downtrodden to rise up. There's a major difference between the kingdom idea of greatness and the world's idea of greatness. <sighs> My God. 
my God. In the kingdom, God takes us from minus through zero, through thousand to million. But the world just takes millions to keep them as millions. That's all the world does. He said, Pastor, where are you getting all these ideas from? I tell you what. I used to teach in a school, so I know what I'm talking about. In the schools, when the schools are doing their selections, they go for the best to get the best results. No school wants goes for the poor or for the bad students or the weak students. Those who didn't do well, to say, you know what, we want to help these students. So let's go and get them into our school. And let's transform them. No. They always go for the best. And then at the end of the period, they say, well, we, we got the best result. Of course you get the best result because you went for the best. And then those schools with the poor ones, when they manage to get a child from negative four, Two plus three or even plus two they are considered as having done nothing but when you think about it they have done great because they've lit the people from the negative to the positive I believe that God is looking for a kingdom school a kingdom school a kingdom school that would take the weak, train them, put tools in their hands, equip them to become the best students. Because most people don't want to, the world don't want to do that. It's too hard. And that idea is in the church. That idea, unfortunately, is in. It's in some church assemblies. Some people, they enter a church. An assembly of God's people. They enter there. And they see that these people here, they are all amateurs. None of them knows how to do anything. They can't sing well. They can't play instruments well. They can't even preach well. They can't organize well. And do you know what they say? I don't belong to this church. I, I, I'm an, I'm an expert in administration. And this church is bad in administration. So, bye-bye. And you call yourself Christian. Call to greatness. So, they go away. And they go and look for a place where things are organized. And ah, oh, this is where I love to be. Because, because, you see, I like greatness. I mean, I like order. I like discipline. So, that's why I like uh, to be. I went to that church. Their singers were so bad. I couldn't endure them. But you are good. Why don't you stay there and lift them up? That is greatness in the kingdom. But these things are missing. Oh, God have mercy. 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 God is calling us to greatness. Calling us to greatness. And in this greatness, we identify with those who are needy, dependent, need support, and we lift them up. Oh, oh, oh my God. My God, my God. My God. My God. I pray that something will turn in our hearts. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the entire people of God in, in assemblies of God, wherever we are. God have mercy. So that I don't keep you waiting, let's, let's carry on. And, um, and, and in the verse 49, after Jesus said, so the least, so what do you mean by the least is the, the one that has this mentality the one that has this mindset of identifying 
Because if, 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 if you have this mind that was in Christ, to be able to, you know, come low, come low, to identify with the needy, those needy su support and the dependent, to help them, you are called the least. I mean, like, you are able to bring yourself low to support. And when you support it, don't forget to always run back for strength. Hallelujah. <laughs> So you can keep on. You don't stay there. You vacillate between the two posts. Engaging with him and coming down to help. Engaging with him coming down to, to help. Because if you stay there, everything you had will be gone and there will be nothing left. But that's where the wisdom of the world ends. And the world doesn't tell you, go, run back to him. But in the kingdom, he does. Run back there for more strength. And keep on serving. Tell someone, keep on serving. 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 Hallelujah. Keep on receiving and serving. 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 And in verse 49, John said, Jesus, because of what Christ said, John now responded and said, Master, we saw someone who was doing one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him we told him stop it you are naughty stop it because why because he followeth us not he is not part of our group you don't belong to our group you get a you get a sense here it is called the class system it is called the class system. He is not part of our group. You don't belong to our group. I remember years ago when I first came here and um, I was helping with a church. That church was not that church was not known, and I came across some guys who had a their church was known in London. It was a big, it had a big name. I will not mention their name, but it had a big name. But in talking to them, the sense I was getting was that, you know what, you guys are nobodies because nobody even knows you. And we are the somebodies. You know, we are. So what, what we say is what is. And you guys are nobodies. So nobody even knows you. I never, that thing never clicked. That, what? So because you've got a very massive con con congregation, that makes you special. And those ones that are not ma massive are nothing. I never click with that the kind, of, kind of thing. But that's the kind of thing that we see here, you know. It's, it's a classic system. And I've heard some people say, if your congregation is just like five or ten, I'll never preach in your, in your church. Keep on working. When you get to about 50 or 100, then I'll come and support you. Why do I need you when I've already made the mark, the mark, you see. So, here, it, it is that class system where John was saying that because this guy is not in our group, he doesn't belong to this group that we are in, we shouldn't consider him. Forget about him. And Christ corrected it. And Christ said, if he is not against you, he is for you. So, basically, what Christ was saying here is this. In the kingdom, greatness encourages others. It doesn't stop them. It encourages others who are not in our fold. Oftentimes, people think that because someone doesn't go to my church or doesn't come to my church, then they are not really proper Christians and they, they are not really part of us. Hey, no, no, no. Christ says if, if he's not against us, then he is for us. Oh Lord God Almighty. Oh God. He doesn't come to Christ City Church, so we don't want to know. No. Encourage. He says, so Christ said, no. Don't forbid him. If he's casting out devils like we cast out devils, 
in my name. He's cast my devils in my name. And you said in my name, he's for us. He's, he's, he, 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 he's on our side. He is on our side. So you see, let's be out there to encourage. Christ, did ne- Christ is the Messiah. He is a Christ of God, the master teacher. But look here. He did not consider himself as the ultimate. He alone can do it. Nobody else can, can do it. God have mercy and deliver us from that kind of under- mindset that only I can do it. No! Others must be encouraged to do it too. Because one person can do it. And Christ makes that point very clear here. If he's not against us, he is for us. Encourage him. Encourage him. Encourage people. Hallelujah. John had a close, John had a closed door mentality. Close door. He's not part of our fold, so close the door. Encourage him to be part. Let's encourage people. The things that we know, let's pass them on to other to others. You know something, pass it on willingly, freely. But but make sure who you're passing on to wants it. Or else you pass on in vain. So that's the caveat. Make sure what you're passing on, those who are passing on to are ready for it. Because when people are not ready for it, you'll get passed on and it will just be there. But when people are eager and ready, pass on. Praise God. See, so, base, so basically, this person was a loner. This person who was casting out demos was a loner. He didn't have the brand. He, he didn't have the Jesus, you know. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ and his group, they were like the elite group. I mean, I mean, yeah, the Pharisees didn't like them, but at least they were still powerful. Because they were doing the signs and wonders and they were doing all the great teachings. But here we have someone who is a loner. A single person on his own. And unfortunately, the world is very good at that. What John was saying here, the world is good at that. The world will crush you. Big companies keep identifying with themselves and making themselves big. And if you are small, hmm, we'll betize you. We will do all we can to just crush you. Shouldn't exist. God have mercy. God have mercy. A local person trying to do something. Oh God deliver us. God help us that we will have true greatness in our world and in our society. That we will get people who promote true greatness. Help those lone, those single people who are trying to do something. They haven't got a brand, they haven't got a name, they haven't got a thing, but they are just, they are thieving. Oh God, help us with indeed great leaders who will help these people rise up too. The world wouldn't want you to join them. The world wants to just create that class system where, you know, we are the only ones and we just want to be the only ones. But God have mercy. Christ said no. Christ wanted help us. Christ encouraged more helpers, although he is a Christ. He encouraged more helpers. The kingdom of God encourages helpers, more helpers to come on board. That is what is needed. God have mercy. God have mercy. Is there any word you? Father, we pray. I would like to bring my message to a close. I didn't intend to get into this state. But it's very moving that Our idea of greatness
from what we have seen around us. It's not the same as the kingdom idea of greatness. Great people are free people. Great people are free people. They're not intimidated. If a person is, is afraid that those single people who are, those people who are rising up, those who are, are, are around, they call them competitors. If anybody is great and he sees those things as competitors and he's scared of them, that person is yet to experience great, greatness. It means we are yet to experience greatness in God's kingdom. Because wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's liberty. We are not bound and we are not in fear. There's freedom in Christ. His love has captured us. And we fear nothing. Because we understand purpose. We understand that everyone has his own track. We may be doing the same thing. But your approach will be in your own track. Why should he scare me? God have mercy. God have mercy. God have mercy. Before we end, if you're hearing me today and you're not born again, you don't know Jesus Christ. You have a desire to be great in the world. But your idea of greatness... Your idea of greatness is, is just to over, outshine everyone and be on the top. And you don't care who you stump upon on the way. You don't care what you do to people. All you want is just to become renowned. But you, and, you, and you know the attitude, the spirit is not of God. God have mercy. You want to pray, say, God have mercy on my soul. Save me, deliver me. I'm a sinner. I want to be born again. Save me from this attitude, from this mindset. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to live my life as a great person. In it. I want to live out this concept of greatness in the, in the kingdom. Why I am out there to help the helpless. Identify with the socially insignificant. And encourage other helpers. Help me, Lord. But before that, you want to pray and say, Lord God, forgive me my sins. Wash me by the blood of Christ. Give me your life, O oh God. Make me a child of God. Make me born again. Talk to him. If you don't know him and you want to be a Christian, you deserve to be a Christian because you're not sure even when you die right now, where are you going to go? You're not sure. There's fear in your heart. Ask him to forgive you. And give you his life. That the joy of life and the hope of eternity will be set in your heart. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Even as, even as those other people pray, you, but you are also a Christian. And, and you know that your understanding of, the, of, of greatness has not been like what we have seen here in scripture. You want to pray and say, Lord, help me, help me, help me. Today... Today, I change my mentality. I change my mind. I change my mind totally to, 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 to align my, my mind with, with, with your understanding or your idea of greatness. Today, I bring my mind in line with your idea of greatness. Help me, Lord God. Help me, Lord God. Help me, Lord God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you praise. The word of God, I must say to you, is quick and active. The word of God is living. The word of God is not just a mere written text. The word of God is living. It's a living thing. When the word of God proceeds, when it comes out from the mouth of God, as Matthew puts it, when it comes out from the mouth of God, it is a living and active word, powerful, able to 
effect change and change things. It is not a dead letter. God's word is living. I am talking about the word that proceeds from the mouth of the living God. It is active, it is powerful. 